is that really in the Bible? You live in a world where everyone has an opinion about the Bible. Of what values are your beliefs if they are not clearly found in the pages of your Bible? The question we must ask is, are your opinions and beliefs really found in the Bible? Well, hello, I'm David Freeman with Is That Really in the Bible? What I want to talk about today is a bit of an encouragement of how to maintain a relationship with God without church and religion. You know, about five or six, seven years ago, I did a program on how to begin a relationship with God without church and religion. And I visualized in my mind that long ago that there would come a time when churches would cease to exist or be closed down or be barred by our government or, or whatever. I really didn't think of a virus that, uh, so I didn't make that connection, but still the result is the same. So I think it's uh, critical that we understand your need to maintain a relationship with God without church and religion. You know, we have nearly shut our nation down, the economy, the schools, the uh, churches, over a virus that if you catch it, there's a 98% chance that you will recover from it. You know, you may fit into that 2% who would die, but still, I'm just saying, now the dark side knows how to manipulate and control us. And it's very simple. It's always been the same. It's a four-letter word, fear. All it takes is a little bit of fear, and the fear of dying. And these people can be totally, I mean, we'll just roll over and play dead like a dog. We will surrender our freedoms because of the fear of death. And it's fascinating to see this. It really is. And, you know, the dark side, the evil side, wants global socialism. The Pope is for it. The UN is for it. And um, now they know how to control us. And do not, think, do not kid yourself. Yeah, we'll get past this. But do not kid yourself into, in understanding, understand this. There is coronavirus, it may go by another name, but there is coronavirus number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all lined up in the making, you know, ready to control us again. And it will happen again. This is just a learning curve for the dark side to learn how to control the people. So anyway, having said that, we do need to maintain a relationship with God uh, without church and religion and to know how to do this. Now, church is probably one of the greatest overrated things in the world, and that is going to church. It really is. Now, when you look at the Bible and you say, okay, where did the church meet? You begin to pick up some thing, on some things, and, and I, I, I really don't expect you to know this because I know most people don't read their Bibles. Most religious people don't really pick up on what the Word of God actually says. But in Acts 2 and verse 46, it talks about meeting house to house. Acts 5 and verse 42 talks about house to house. Uh, Acts 8 and verse 3 talks about they met you know, house to house. It talks about in Mary's house, in, in, in uh, the jailer's house. And again and again and again, you realize that the New Testament church, they were meeting in houses. And uh, you see, he, he, here's the thing. When you go to a church, you are being replicated by the preacher. Whatever he thinks is what you think. And it's one man standing up there. And it may be a thousand people out there in the congregation, and you're just being replicated as to think like he thinks. It's just like someone pours a, 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 a drills a hole in your head, and they pour in mainstream churchianity. And of course, he's been to seminary school, and he's just teaching you what, what he has understood about God. And most of us never, it, we don't crack open the Bible for ourselves. I mean, I actually think it would do you a world of good to have three or four people at your home studying the Word of God. I mean, you would be amazed to find out truth that's always been in the Bible, 
but you never come across it. Why? Why have you never come across such truths from the Bible? Well, because preachers, there's a lot of stuff they can't talk about. There's a lot of areas that are totally off limits for preachers. They can't talk about instructions on how to keep the Sabbath. Why? Because they don't keep it. I mean, the Sabbath is the day of connectivity with God. It tells us how to connect with, the, with God Almighty. That's what the Sabbath is all about. But they can't go there because they don't honor God's Sabbath. They can't teach you about instructions on the holy days, which are all about Jesus Christ, because they don't keep the holy days. They can't teach you about the dietary laws, about personal health. I mean, you would think church would be a place that you could go to get spiritually healthy, but physically healthy also, and learn about the foods that God says is meant for human consumptions and the ones you should not be eating. But they can't go there because they don't keep the dietary laws. Listen, 60 to 70% of the Bible is totally off limits to preachers. And yet you're sitting there smiling and nodding your head and you're just mimicking what, what he t tells you. Yeah, home study groups would be a wonderful thing for you to do and to get involved in and, and just learn from the Word of God. Preachers, they can't go to the Old Testament laws that tell you how to make your life work. They can't go there because they, they've got a theology that says the law's been abolished, been nailed to the cross, has been fulfilled, has been done away with. So, so, you know, I said 60 to 70 percent. It may be more like 90 percent. They can't talk about it. They can't preach about it. All you're going to hear is the same old pablum of Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And beyond that, you're not going to get a lot, okay? You're not going to get... So, imagine what would happen if you actually blew the dust off your Bible, open it up, and in a home study group or maybe a few other people over, you begin to study the Word of God. It could change your life. It could absolutely change your life. So I'm talking about how to maintain a relationship with God without church and religion. Now, like I said, church is the most overrated event out there. It really is. And, and I want to ask you a question. Would God ever tell us not to go to church? Now, here we are in the middle of a, what they call an epidemic, you know, this, this you know. Again, if you, even if you catch the virus, 98% recover from it. But, but here we are living in fear. And we can't go to church, whatever. But um, would God ever tell us not to go to church? Now, that's, that's forget uh, the doing, you know, Okay, the government recommendation, I mean, I think it's probably a good thing that, it, that we don't want to spread our germs around. So social distancing, I mean, I've been doing that for 57 years all my life, and so it just comes natural to me what's going on. Uh, I don't even see any difference, hardly, in the way I'm living my life. But would God ever tell us not to go to church? Well, let's take a look at Isaiah 1 and verse 13. And I'm reading from the Message Bible. A little bit different translation here, but it says, Quit your worship charades. I can't stand your trivial religious games. Monthly conferences, weekly Sabbaths, special meetings, meetings, meetings. I can't stand one more. Meetings for this, meetings for that. I hate them. You've worn me out. I'm sick of your religion, 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 while you go right on sinning. So God comes along and says, look, quit, quit church. Quit it. Why? Because you keep right on sinning. Now, what does this mean, you keep right on sinning? Well, let me, let me explain it to you. My, uh, a fellow minister of mine was telling this story several years ago about how that his business took and sent uh, three of them to Myrtle Beach for an outing. Uh, it was a weekend golfing thing. And to show their appreciation to the workers. And it was, it was my friend and two other religious guys. Uh, one kept a prayer journal. The other one was always singing religious songs. And, and so they were, they were all three religious, okay, or at least fit into that category. Or at least, you know, at least two of them were a wannabe Christian. But anyway, and they get to Myrtle Beach. And, and once they get to the beach, the other two guys... It, just, it was imperative that they go to one of these gentlemen's clubs. 
I don't know why they call them gentlemen's club. They ought to call them men horror clubs, but that's what they are, you know. But gentlemen's clubs, you know. And they asked my friend. They said, do you want to go? He said, no, I'm not going. He said, I'm a, I'm a married man. And they said, we are too. And so they go to, the two of them go to a gentleman's club. Now, I, I was just wondering, I thought, how can you call yourself a Christian and go to a gentleman's club? And, and it was really tormenting me, you know, the question. And finally, someone helped me understand it. They said, David, get real. I said, this is, this is what's going on. Yeah, they call himself Christian, but said, what they'll do is they'll go to church next Sunday and they'll ask for forgiveness. And I, everything clicked and I thought, well, that's it. That's it. Of course that's it. It's a life of sin and confess, sin and confess. I'll just go and ask for, I, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'll confess it next Sunday. And God says, quit your worship charades. I can't stand your religion because you go right on sinning. Now, if you sin, you are supposed to confess your sins. But my point is this. The real Christian life is about victory over sin. That's what it's about. It's not about living the rest of your life until you're 95 years old, just, just confessing, sinning and confessing the same old sin over and over again. That's not victory, you see. So God says, look, quit your worship charades. I can't stomach your church going. Continuing on, Isaiah 1 and verse 15, when you put on your next prayer performance, I'll be looking the other way. I love that. Your prayer performance, hands up in the air, praising Jesus. Yes, I'll be looking the other way. No matter how long or loud or often you pray, I'll not be listening. And do you know why? Because you've been tearing pieces, people to pieces and your hands are bloody. I got to thinking, you know, what, what does that mean? Our hands are bloody. You know, and you can look this up on um, uh, uh, worldometer.info about the total deaths uh, from January 1st to March 25th. Coronavirus deaths was 21,297. Uh, 21,297. The deaths from abortion has been 9,900,702. So when God talks about your hands are defiled with blood. You got blood on your hands. Maybe it's a reference to, you know, abortion. And you compare that to the deaths by the coronavirus, there really is no comparison. You know, we are such a hypocritical nation, and, and, but we're, we're, we're living in fear because, oh no, I might be the one that has to die. I might catch this and die. You know, I mean, What's wrong with you dying? Do you not have any faith that God can resurrect you from the dead? So what if you do die? You know, how big a deal is that? I mean, um, you don't have to worry about paying taxes. You don't have to worry about your children a lot. You don't have to worry about when you die. But, uh, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, just, just absolute fear. Absolute fear. And boy, have they learned how to control us. A learning curve for the dark side. Edu you know, education, when you learn stuff about people, you learn how to control them, you know. And this has really been a learning experience for the dark side. Okay, I already covered that. But anyway, I'm talking about how to maintain a relationship with God without church and religion. Now, I said that church was one of the most overrated events out there. What was Adam and Eve's religion? Let's go here for a moment. Uh, did they read, you know, a creed every Sunday? Did they, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, you know, thy, did they recite that all together every Sabbath day or whatever? No, I doubt it. Uh, did they read the Athanasian Creed? I, I want to read to you, now this is from the Catholic Church. This will blow your mind right here, the Athanasian Creed. You can look it up on the internet. It says, whosoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Okay, in order to be saved, you've got to hold the Catholic faith. Man, sort of a biased opinion there. Which faith, except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlasting. Everlasting, that's a long time. 
And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the person nor dividing the substance. Neither confounding the person nor dividing the substance. What in the, does, what does that mean? Okay, for there is one person of the Father and another of the Son and another of the Holy Spirit, but the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is all one, the glory equal and majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such as the Son is, such as the Holy Spirit is, the Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated, the Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the Holy Spirit incomprehensible. You, do you know what the word incomprehensible means? It means you can't get it. We got a God, but we can't get it. We can't understand it. Our hands, we just throw our hands up in the air and say, I can't get it. Incomprehensible. Okay. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. As also there are not three uncreated or three incomprehensible, but one uncreated and one incomprehensible. So likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, the Holy Spirit almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods but one God. So likewise the Father is Lord, the Son Lord, and the Holy Spirit Lord, and yet there are not three lords but one Lord. Are, are you getting this nonsense? Now, now and, and what's interesting, it, it concludes by saying, he that is going to be saved must thus believe in the Trinity. In order to be saved, you've got to believe that, that nonsense. You know, I'm just saying, religion is... Religion, you know, uh, church is church, and there's just a lot in there that is not biblical, that comes from the intellectual, you know, some people are so, I don't know, they're beyond, they're, they're intelligent, but their intelligence lacks any common sense. Uh, the intellectuals, you know, well, I don't know about that. Uh, you know, just, just on and on and on. And that's the kind of irrelevant knowledge right there that I just threw down on the floor, the Athanasian Creed. It's not going to do you a bit of good. It's not going to bring you closer to God, even if you can recite it. So what was Adam and Eve's religion is, is my question. Well, let's simplify it. Number one, they understood that they could obey or disobey God. Obedience, get this. If you don't get anything else about what I'm about to say, understand this. Obedience was voluntary. Yeah. Do I have to do that to be saved? Obedience is voluntary. Yeah, you know, people ask that question all the time. Do I have to do that? Do I really have to keep this out today? Do I really have to keep... You know, they, <laughs> I'm not sure what people are looking for. But uh, here's the thing. Obedience was voluntary. It was up to you, the individual, to, to decide. Let's notice Genesis 2 and verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. So they understood. Obedience, they could obey or disobey God, and that obedience was voluntary. That, that, that's basically what constituted their relationship with God. Okay? The second thing was they had the seventh-day Sabbath which was a, a blessing, a memorial of creation. Let us notice this. Genesis 2 and verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. That means made holy. Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. You see, the Sabbath day was a day of connectivity. It's what kept Adam and Eve in a relationship with God. Every seventh day, you rested on this day, and it was a day to disconnect from the world and connect with God. Now, I, you know, a lot of people that watch my program, I think one of the things that has hindered them from entering into a relationship with God is, well, I can't keep the Sabbath, you know. And, and you're finding out now that, yes, you could. I mean, your work maybe has told you to go home. And, uh, you know, uh, it's possible for you to keep the Sabbath day because it's critical in your relationship with God. A day you disconnect from the world and connect with God. Now, this is what Adam and Eve had. They, they understood obedience was voluntary and they had the Sabbath day where every seventh day 
they disconnect it and connect it with God. They stopped doing, they unplugged themselves like an overloaded receptacle, you know, where you got 20 things running into one receptacle. They just unplugged it and they connect it with God. And I'm telling you how to maintain your relationship with God without church and religion. And I think it's, I just want to mention this, how men and women are different. You know, men often will be in the, an independent spirit. Yeah, I got my relationship with God and that's all that matters. Women often need, husband and wives, they look at it as a whole package. It's, it's me, it's my, the wife, the husband, and God. It's a complete package. And you need to be a leader. As a man, you need to be a leader in your relationship with God. You need to take that time at home to sit down, and the Sabbath is a perfect day to do this, maintaining your relationship with God without church and religion, and to study the Word of God together. You know, have your wife's input on this. Now, I know a lot of times this is tough. Sometimes women come into the church first, and their husband maybe is not interested, and so you've got to walk that road alone for a while. Uh, and it's tough, but what, what a woman really desires is for the man to pull up his pants and be a leader in a relationship with God. Okay, where did they go to church, Adam and Eve? You know, well, here, here, now get this. This is amazing what I'm about to tell you here. 2,000 years from creation, you know, Adam and Eve, 2,000 years goes by before the first commanded holy convocation is ever given. Did, did you get that? 2,000 years goes by. They had the Sabbath. They knew obedience was voluntary. They could obey or disobey. 2,000 years goes by before the first commanded assembling of people together. And it's not really even a church service like you think of a church service. It was the first day of unleavened bread. It was one of God's holy days. It's found in Exodus 12 and verse 16. It says, in the first day there shall be a holy convocation. Now, I just think that's interesting because, you know, uh, it's people having an addiction to church going, okay? They really do. And let's notice something that Jesus said about the subject of church. John 4 and verse 19, And the woman said unto her, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say in Jerusalem is the place that men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour has come when you shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming. Now notice this. And now is, now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. For God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, what I'm trying to do is to break the mold of your addiction to going to church. And we're talking about how to maintain a relationship with God without church and religion. And Jesus says you need two things. You need truth and you need the Spirit of God. Now, I want to offer you something here that is critical on how to receive the Spirit of God. Uh, that's the title of it how to receive the Spirit of God, should you be baptized, is another free offer, and baptism, baptism counseling, what you should have known before being baptized. I will send this to you free of charge. It's yours for the asking because you have got to, in order to truly understand God, you've got to have the Holy Spirit of God. Now, here's the thing. Let, let me explain something to you here. Uh... Let me just give you a little analogy here. If I, if I told you you need to keep the dietary laws, the food laws of God for your personal health. Now, get this. You're already keeping about 85% of those dietary laws. You don't eat snakes and cats and bats and rats. and There's a lot you don't eat, vultures. You're already keeping 85% of the dietary laws. But if I told you you need to keep them all, which includes some more animals that Americans like to eat, but they're scavengers. They're not fit for human consumption. You know, if I tell you that, probably you're going to lack the conviction to do anything about it. You, you may agree with me. You may not agree with me. But you're going to say, I, I, I can't do that. That's too hard. I don't want to do that or whatever. This is where the Spirit of God comes in at. You see, the Spirit of God 
will lead you into all truth. You don't have to get everything right before receiving the Spirit of God. You don't have to have all of your doctrines and, and being obedience to this and that. The Spirit enhances and will give you the conviction to do the right thing. That's why this publication is so critical. How to receive the Spirit of God should you be baptized and what you should have known before being baptized. Uh, this is an audio, uh, couple CDs in there. And it's critical information because in a true relationship with God, you've got to have the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life. When you have the leadership of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter if every church across the land shuts down. Church is like dessert. It really is. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's fun. We enjoy the fellowship. We enjoy the pick-me-up pep rally message, a little short little message makes me feel good for another six days. We enjoy that. But it's not necessary for you to stay alive. It's not necessary for you to maintain a relationship with God, you see. Now, I know preachers would just barf at that because they've got something called the, the golden idol of the offering plate. And when that offering plate starts to get empty, they get upset because that's their livelihood. And so churches are having drive-in drive churches, which is, I mean, to me, it's like, can't I listen to this at home, you know? But it's, the, it's that golden altar of the offering plate that's got to be filled up. So we're going to devise ways to do this now. Now, in our church, we don't take up an offering. I, I just believe in tithing, you know, if, you, if, if you're, and that's between you and God. You know, you give, okay, give to God. It has nothing to do with me, but we don't pass the offering plate around. You know, people pass the offering plate around and, and put in $5 and take $3 back out. And they make change or whatever. Okay, we don't do that. But anyway, what I'm saying is order this material because in order for you, you you've got to start here with the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, this will tell you what you need to do in order to receive the Spirit of God. And the leadership of the Holy Spirit is the most critical thing you can have to maintain your relationship with God, with Jesus Christ. I'm David Freeman, and that's what's really in your Bible. Many people spend their whole life repeating the same old mistakes. What does it take to have good discernment and good judgment? It takes having the Spirit of God. But what many people overlook is the Spirit of God is not something that you are born with. Man was created incomplete, missing that spiritual element that would make him complete. The Bible clearly lays out the way to receive the Spirit of God. Learn the step-by-step -step process for receiving the Spirit of God. Order your free copy of Why You Need the Holy Spirit. Order by writing to Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. Also, visit us on the web at isthatreallyinthebible.org.